Okay, so it's a bit of a shirt house night tonight in the capital weather wise. I'm at Wellington Railway Station. This is a bell recovered from one of two candidate Manawatu line locomotives. Not sure which locomotive, doesn't matter for the purposes of this video because they were both Vulcan compounds. Alright, let's get into it. In the last episode we looked at cross compounds and the literature says that there were a couple of examples built for passenger service which goes against the grain for that type of compounding because they were almost exclusively freight locomotives. The literature unhelpfully didn't say which locomotive on which road but I found a candidate from the St Mary's Rapids line it's 63 inch driver. It's reported in the trade literature as being for passenger work. It also failed in that role. Even with those higher drivers, the asymmetric thrust at passenger speeds could not be overcome. Within a year, it was converted to a simple expansion locomotive and gave long service from there. So that particular locomotive struggled with asymmetric thrust and back pressure. Now keep asymmetric thrust and back pressure in mind for the rest of this video and also in mind frankly whenever a compound locomotive is considered. The first compound locomotive introduced into North American traffic was this example here. It's a couple of decades before the tandem type found its niche. It, like the Sioux line example, failed pretty quickly, although Colvin in his book reports it as having lasted in service, compound service, for a reasonable period of time. White, by comparison, says it was converted to simple expansion pretty quickly. I tend to go with White. The boiler pressure at that time wouldn't have been particularly high, and there's a massive ratio of volume between the high pressure cylinder and the low pressure cylinder. So it's exceedingly likely that the amount of draft created by the exhaust steam would have been insufficient to generate steam in any meaningful sense. If we fast forward a decade or two, the Schenectady Works offered tandem compounds in their catalogues, but at that stage the cross compounds were still doing the job. So it was a difficult market to go beyond the more straightforward cross compounds when train loads and road speeds were still within the wheelhouse of those much more straightforward cross compound types. If we look at the tractive effort equation for compounds, we can see that the tractive effort is calculated primarily from the volume of the high pressure cylinders. So cross compounds reached their evolutionary wall when the high pressure cylinder volume reached its limits. And that limit and the capacity of the high pressure cylinder was dependent on the basis of that two to two and a half ratio on the volume of the low pressure cylinder and those low pressure cylinders soon reached the loading gauge limit. So once cross compounds hit the wall of loading gauge, roads were more likely to turn to other types of compounding. Numerically at least, the most successful form of compounding in North America was the Volklane system. It addressed asymmetry by putting the high pressure cylinder on top of the low pressure cylinder with one pair on the driver's side and another pair on the fireman's side. Each pair was served by one valve and each pair drove a common crosshead. So we've gone from a two cylinder cross compound locomotive to a four cylinder Volklane compound locomotive. This has been achieved without offending the limits of loading gauge. The most common illustration of the Volklane system is this one here, but it's a schematic. In fact, the valve sat next to the high pressure cylinder. That valve controlled the admission steam from the boiler to the high pressure cylinder, 
the steam released from the high pressure cylinder into the receiver, which is the chamber that provided the link between high and low pressure and was effectively the valve. And then admission into the low pressure cylinder and finally exhaust from that low pressure cylinder up the chimney. The point of cutoff in the high pressure cylinder sets the scene for all that happens downstream from that event. So as is typical with compound locomotives, there's a happy band of throttle setting and cutoff point where the locomotive is able to develop its power most effectively and most economically. Outside of that band, efficiency and economy is not so great. In theory, when looking at the tractive effort equation for compound locomotives, they should be more efficient than their similarly sized simple brethren by a rate of about 40%. But that's at the optimal setting for throttle and cutoff. The reality out on the road is that there are starts and stops, there are hills, that there's acceleration and deceleration. Compounds went best when in a steady state of work. They were not suited, for instance, to suburban work. The actual economy percentage was more like 10 to 15 per cent, taking into account the typical road service. That's still quite useful, but it's not so useful as to remove the greater complexity and the greater cost of maintenance from the compound locomotive calculations. And that issue of maintenance complexity is one that features a lot in the literature about compounds. An example with the Baldwin type is this. The crosshead has to run horizontally. So in applications where the driver height is quite low, and because the crosshead has to point directly to the hub of the primary driving wheel, it means that the cylinder arrangement has to be inverted so that the high pressure cylinder and the valve are below the low pressure cylinder. This places the valve effectively under the pilot deck, which makes access to it for maintenance much more problematic than otherwise and provides unneeded complexity to the maintenance tasks. That's just one example. There's also the fact that the problem with asymmetry was never really solved. At startup, boiler steam is introduced to the receiver. And because of that, we have live steam on both faces of the high pressure piston and on one face of the low pressure piston. So what that does is it cancels out any work from the high pressure piston. That means that at startup, there's asymmetric thrust with the low pressure cylinder, which more or less becomes a giant high pressure cylinder for a few rotations at least, is doing all the work. This puts asymmetric strain on the crosshead, which means that it needs to be replaced more often than desirable. So again, another example of increased maintenance in a compound context. Now the Volklane system named after its inventor was patent protected. It's lapsed now if you want to give it a go, knock yourself out. And of course Volklane was the driving force behind Baldwin at that time. So the other manufacturers, soon to amalgamate into Alco, had to come up with an alternative to the Volklane system, and that's where tandem compounds re-emerged. Here's an early example from the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railway, fairly typical of the type, and you'll see that asymmetric thrust has been addressed by putting the high pressure cylinder in front of the low pressure cylinder on a common piston rod, driving again a common crosshead. There's a lot of weight in the moving reciprocal parts. Two pistons, a double link piston rod, a double valve system, and all the weight that that entails. And because these were low speed locomotives with low drivers, in order to promote the greatest possible tractive effort, there was limited space for counterweighting and, and therefore road speeds were more limited than the driver height would suggest. Now I mentioned driver height on the tandem compounds and that they were universally quite low. 
On the bulk lane compounds, there are plenty of examples with high driver height, some of them quite high. Not exactly Empire State Express 999 high, but certainly high enough. There's something to be remembered when looking at the driver height on those bulk lane compounds, and that is back pressure, which is the bane of all steam locomotives, but especially so in a compound context. And that comes back to the nature of tandem compounds and bulk lane compounds, where there is open communication between the exhaust port on the high pressure cylinder when it is open, and the admission port on the low pressure cylinder when that is open. The more potent that intermediate steam in the receiver is, the more back pressure exerted on the non-working face of the high pressure cylinder, and ultimately downstream, the higher the pressure of the exhaust steam, which also works against the non-working face of the low pressure cylinder. Now, the best way to manage back pressure is to control valve speed. The lower the valve speed, the more time the valve movements have to deal with exhaust steam. Valve speed is a product of the revolutions per minute of the driving wheels. The way to manage valve speed was to use oversized drivers. But on a Volklane compound, the desired road speed might be, say, 55, 60 miles per hour, but the driver height is up in the 70 or 80 inch range. This means a lower RPM of the drivers at the desired road speed, and in turn, a lower valve speed thus allowing better management of steam and less of a problem created by back pressure. Now back to the tandem compound locomotives, one last word about maintenance because this is probably the most problematic example of compound maintenance. That is the issue of working on one piston or one valve when they are inextricably linked to another piston or valve. And each manufacturer had their own way of addressing that, but none of those schemes really solved the problem. And emblematic of the manufacturers recognising the flaw in tandem compounds is the triangular bracket you see on the side of the smoke box for Baldwin built examples. That bracket, when deployed, could be used to winch off and then winch back on again the high pressure cylinder because they were designed to be able to be removed in order, for instance, to service the packing that needs to keep the high pressure cylinder steam tight and separate from its mate, the low pressure cylinder, and vice versa. So there you go, that's a quick look at tandem compounds and Volklane compounds. All right, like, subscribe, enjoy. Have a good night. Cheers.